What do I care for the principles of science? Page four of the 1914 book, Tom Swift and His Photo Telephone, contains an emotional high point for not only this volume, but for the entire series. The young inventor, Tom Swift, is having a spirited debate with his father, Barton Swift, an inventor himself, about Tom's newest idea, a telephone which lets you see the person on the other end of the wire. Now, while this seems fantastical, and it was to a degree, it was what readers had come to expect from the adventure stories about a young man from Shopton, New York, on Lake Carlopa, really Hammond's port on Cuca Lake. Whether, uh, whatever Tom and his friends invented, it proved to be exactly what was needed for the next adventure. Often these were in the form of an aircraft or land vehicle or a rifle that could kill or stun with electricity. Of course, the, uh, the series had its critics, including librarians who felt that the stories were highly improbable uh, for the activities of a young person. Yet, even before the series began in 1910, there were articles about young people building aircraft and flying them. These are examples from 1909. But who invented Tom Swift? Edward Stratemeyer was a prolific author who wrote 169 stories published as books and many more found only on the pages of periodicals. Despite this prodigious output, he had more ideas for stories than he had time to write them himself. So he borrowed methods from the newspapers, syndication, a means of selling stories to multiple publications. In his case, the Stratemeyer Syndicate, which he founded in 1905, became what today might be called a book packager. We're so used to the idea of an author like Mark Twain writing everything himself that the notion of books being produced through a packager, like the Syndicate, requires some introduction. Stratemeyer would come up with an idea for a new series and characters and convince one of his publishers to agree to publish it. He'd give them some sample titles with uh, short descriptions and they would select the titles that, that he should produce. From the approved list, Stratemeyer would create outlines, usually a couple of pages of single space text that describe the, uh, the plots of the stories. He would also contact one of his writers uh, who would be suitable for this material. If the writer was available, he'd send the outline with any additional instructions. About four weeks later, the writer would return the story and outline for reading. After a hasty uh, reading of the story, Stratemeyer would uh, send payment uh, and a release to be signed. Stratemeyer would next edit the story with an, uh, an assistant named Harriet Otis Smith to prepare it for the publisher. Once the story was published, two copies were sent so they could be copyrighted. The this, this publisher's uh, sales force would take orders from booksellers and department stores to make the uh, book available for the public. The publisher took out ads in trade magazines to promote the books uh, in the fall when they would have the largest sales. Gross and Dunlap even provided electrotype illustration cuts of, uh, of covers for booksellers to use in their print advertising. Gross had even uh, uh, highlighted unusual promotional schemes like store window displays in their trade magazine, The Business Promoter, like this one with a group of Gross and Dunlap books and a hired boy seated on a motorcycle borrowed for the purpose. Stratemeyer's, the Stratemeyer Syndicate was very prolific. Between 1905 and 1985, they produced 1,385 books and about 100 series with about 100 writers working on them. The books were nearly all uh, published under pseudonyms that Stratemeyer controlled. In addition to Tom Swift, uh, the more popular series produced by the syndicate were the Bobsy Twins, Hardy Boys, and Nancy Drew, and many, many others you've never heard of. Some of these uh, series still have new volumes added. Instead of a personal pseudonym like Mark Twain, a, a name like Victor Appleton could, you be, could represent the work of several writers working on a few series. The readers were sometimes led to believe that a, such a person existed. In some cases, fictitious biographies were invented for certain pen names like the ones shown here. The Stratemeyer Syndicate ghostwriters for these stories came from several backgrounds, but by far the most common was having a day job as a newspaper reporter. The career led to quick and interesting writing. When Stratemeyer approved the story, the writer was paid promptly for, uh, with a sum that was equivalent to about two months' wages for a newspaper uh, writer. This was solid moonlighting and kept many of the writers working for uh, the syndicate for decades. 
Howard Garris, born in Binghamton, uh, was also attended the uh, Stevens Institute in Hoboken, and he was the most prolific Stratomar Syndicate ghostwriter. He wrote 315 books for the Stratomar Syndicate in a span of about 30 years. His wife and son also did some writing for the syndicate, but much smaller numbers. On top of the, this and his newspaper work, he also created short stories about Uncle Wiggily, the rheumatic gentleman rabbit, and other anthropomorphic animal friends. He wrote dozens of books outside of the syndicate work. Most of these were published under his own name, but he did do some work for, under uh, publisher pseudonyms and a few personal pseudonyms. Stratomar was the principal writer for the Tom Swift series about a young inventor. These are the first five. And the Moving Picture Boys series, but not the Motion Picture Chums. In the first series, the boys take <laughs> thrilling scenes in exotic locales, uh, but the, in the latter group, the, uh, the boys run storefront th uh, cinemas, and the stories focus on the business aspects. Weldon J. Cobb did the, uh, uh, the Moving Picture Boys. Uh, uh, chums, by the way. Most of the Don Sturdy Adventures uh, series were written by John W. Duffield, another syndicate ghostwriter, despite the claims on the covers of the books that they were by the author of Tom Swift. All of these uh, stories uh, used the Victor Appleton name, so were considered to be uh, uh, the same by readers, despite some of the differences in, in actually reading the stories. Edward Stratomar was to juvenile literature as Rockefeller was to oil. If Iris Brinzer, the anonymous writer for the, an April 1934 article in Fortune magazine, could be believed, he was also called the father of the 50 center uh, in the same article, referring to the retail price that, of many of the books uh, uh, by, the time they, by the 1930s. They started at 40 cents, by the way. When Stratomar died in, in May 1930, his several publishers were rather concerned. He had been supplying them with a significant portion of their juvenile lines. The notion of these popular books uh, halting at, uh, uh, all at once would have been a real problem for them. Now, Edward had two daughters who were both adults in their 30s at the time that he died. Initially, they considered selling the syndicate, even to the Garris family. But the Great Depression was on them all, and so they had to, uh, uh, nobody had money to, uh, to continue running the company. The sisters uh, began to, uh, uh, to learn the business so they could run it themselves. And they did so together for a dozen years. And then the eldest daughter, Harriet uh, Stratomar Adams, uh, a Wellesley graduate, ran the company for the rest of her life. While her father ran the syndicate for 25 years, 1905 to 1930, his uh, daughter ran it for double that period of time, 1930 to 1982, including through the Great Depression, World War II, and the hippies. In the first third of the 20th century, the Tom Swift series was the most successful series produced by the Stratomar Syndicate. 38 books sold a total of 6.5 million copies. Stratomar's own Rover Boys books only sold 2.4 million copies in 30 volumes. The mission statement for the series helped to establish not only the formula, but also the reason why the series was successful. Spirited tales portraying in a realistic manner the wonderful advances in modern invention and interesting the boy in the present in the hope that he too may be a factor in the development of the future. Indeed, the readers of the books cultivated their interest in science, mechanics, invention, aviation, and in writing. Many of a certain generation reading, uh, 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 reading fiction to Sorry, uh, many of, the, of certain generations cited Tom Swift as a primary influence in their careers. The same kind of reading of uh, fiction led to, uh, led to a career is cited for in the works by uh, Jules Verne and the Syndicate's Nancy Drew Mystery Series. Part of the reason that the books resonated was that they were not merely science fiction stories of the Jules Verne type or even the Syndicate's own Great Marvel series seen here. Rather, these stories were, uh, 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 that, that seemed to follow the, uh, the technological developments in newspapers and magazines. Readers could believe that some young person in a well-equipped workshop could be uh, making some of these new marvels somewhere in the country. This verisimilitude uh, be, was possible because Tom's inventions, at least at the time they were published, seemed to be ripped from the headlines of newspapers and magazines like Scientific American, Popular Mechanics, and popular science. 
this is the Barton airship, and Tom's father is named Barton Swift. Probably not a coincidence. Several of the uh, distinctive inventions from the Tom Swift series appear to have antecedents in these publications. This includes synthetic diamonds and a combined airplane and dirigible balloon. Don't see a lot of those at the Smithsonian, though. In Tom Swift and his photo telephone from 1914, and his eccentric older friend and companion in most of the adventures is Mr. Wakefield Damon. A comic relief character, he has a verbal tick whereby he blesses some part of his anatomy or a nearby object. There are hundreds of these in the series. Mr. Damon has a small fortune, but has been worried of late about some bad investments. As it turns out, there is an attempt to swindle his fortune from him. Soon the culprits kidnap him in an effort to gain control of his remaining wealth. Ransom calls are sent by telephone. These are traced to a nearby rural area and appear to come from payphones in general stores. Tom has developed his photo telephone to the point where he thinks it may be able to help find his friend and capture the kidnappers. The payphone booths in the stores are set up with his transmission equipment. It looks like a mirror in the booth. On his side, the receiving equipment can not only show the caller, but also can uh, save the image of the, on a photographic plate and record the voice on a phonograph. Tom hopes that this can be used as evidence in the criminal trial. Now this is a captivating bit of technology and it fit in with some of the predictions by technologists of the day that seeing the person on the other end of the conversation was the next logical step for the telephone. The phrase television was sometimes used for this kind of remote sensing. And as mentioned to me last night, uh, of course, Twain's 1898 story from the London Times in, of uh, 1904, he called th his different sort of uh, television device a teleelectroscope, and it was initially used to exonerate a man convicted of murder. It's a different sort of invention, but uh, certainly some uh, parallel ideas. <coughs> As with Jules Verne and even Star Trek, Tom Swift's stories uh, uh, had an interesting relationship where the real world inventions inspired the, the stories and the stories in, uh, inspired readers to build their own versions of what they had read about. Jack Cover uh, had been inspired after reading a 1911 story, Tom Swift and His Electric Rifle, and as, uh, Under the Ocean to the South Pole from 1907 for the actual mechanism to develop an electric stun gun. The TASER is an acronym based on the title of the book, Tom Swift and His Electric Rifle. Likewise, he had been inspired to, uh, uh, excuse me, likewise, others had been inspired to make the photo telephone device uh, work. A November 28, 1970 issue of TV Guide, and uh, notice the Mark Twain there in the lower uh, corner of that, um, showed a psychiatrist using a, a closed circuit uh, uh, video feed to uh, consult with patients uh, some 25 miles away. He could control the camera and zoom in or out to catch either facial expressions or body language about as well as he could in his office. Other medical professionals were envisioning what we now call telemedicine uh, for consultations. The earliest functional version of the photo telephone concept came from Bell Labs, who was working on, uh, who was showing photos of a prototype of their picture phone in the mid 1950s. The first large scale public demonstrations were in 1964 at the New York World's Fair and Disneyland, with guests from each speaking to one another some 50 years after the Tom Swift story. This, rep this, uh, uh, system was too expensive to really catch on, though it was found in representations of the future, including the Monsanto House of the Future seen here, and in films like uh, Kubrick's uh, 20, 2001 A Space Odyssey from 1968, and it was a staple of the Jetsons uh, starting in 1962. In the photo telephone story, one of the developments uh, mentioned uh, by Tom as a justification for his idea was uh, the, uh, to make it possible to send images over a wire was the, uh, the transmission of hydroplane race uh, photos uh, from 1912 in Monte Carlo that were sent to a newspaper in Paris to uh, be published in the newspaper. This was a form of facsimile service with dedicated equipment and circuits. By the 1930s, newspapers were routinely uh, uh, featured wire service photos. 
Uh, but Tom said that he had a different plan in mind for his device. Now, although it was not specifically mentioned, many of the features described in Tom's invention, including the use of selenium plates, resembles the work of a pioneer uh, German scientist and physicist uh, named Ernst Rumer. Now, his telephot uh, was described by Hugo Gernsback in the December 1909 issue of Modern Electrics magazine. The image shows some early selenium cells, in, including uh, uh, one devised by Rumer on the right. And the, uh, the, the blue image is supposed to be a rumor as well, using an earlier device to transmit uh, vo telephone voice via light beams. Uh, this was about 1905. Gernsback had founded a magazine empire and uh, is particularly noted for starting Amazing Stories in 1926, the first pulp magazine devoted to scientific fiction stories, as he called them. These often were reprints of authors like Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, Edgar Allan Poe, Garrett P. Service, A. Merritt, and others, along with new uh, stories. This led to many other publications that fostered readers and writers of this material and led to not only uh, fandom of the genre, but also inspired people to try to make some of the futuristic inventions real. In addition to having a, a few articles about rumors telephot over the years, Gernsback also worked, uh, to, worked on it to, into his own futurist, futuristic uh, articles and his science fiction stories, like Ralph One to Foresee for Another, which is how that translates, uh, which was published as a serial in Modern Electrics in 1911 and then as a book in 1925. Now, rumors device was. Uh, uh, was described by Gernsback in this Modern Electrics uh, issue, and it had a limited capability. It was very complicated in its implementation. It's, uh, the sending sensors used selenium to detect a five by five uh, uh, pixel pattern. Now these could be transmitted by circuits to a receiving device to reproduce patterns using relays and diaphragms. Rumor hoped to uh, get funding to build a 10,000 element device to demonstrate at the upcoming International Exposition in Brussels. He did not get this funding, however, and died shortly afterwards in 1913, perhaps from his extensive handling of selenium, the mineral that uh, uh, reduces conductivity with exposure to light is also a toxic substance. Gernsback was well aware of the limitations of Rumor's telephot, as indicated in his reply uh, to a reader in June of 1917. The cover with electric rifles uh, uh, in combat in World War I makes one wonder if Gernsback was, uh, uh, and, or his other writers, were reading Tom Swift books as well. When Howard Garris wrote tele Photo Telephone, he was well aware of the mineral's value uh, for this kind of work. It is possible that uh, one of the sources that he consulted was the Gernback description in Modern Electrics or one of the reprints in other publications. Now, most of the Tom Swift inventions were not directly practical as described. They were usually larger, faster, more efficient, or otherwise violated the limits of engineering or the known laws of science. But they seemed possible, and this is what inspired uh, readers young and old to try to make them real. There have been six Tom Swift series thus far. Interestingly, the believability of their inventions has wavered. The Tom Swift Jr. series from the 1950s and 60s, the key recurring inventions violate known physics despite claims that, the, that scientists uh, reviewed the, uh, the manuscripts. <clears throat> the third series from the 1980s was set in the far future and had few inventions. The fourth series from the 1990s had some inventions inspired by popular movies, including hoverboards from Back to the Future 2. The fifth series from the early 2000s had some inventions that might be possible and other ones that were not. The current series uh, is aimed for the middle school level for both reading and characters. And their inventions at the uh, Inventors Academy are back on the, uh, on the trend of uh, being uh, plausible. This factor seems to have gone through a pendulum arc. Now, while Tom Swift might have claimed that he had little care for the principles of science in his debate with his father, the writers of the original stories at least tried to make an effort to pay lip service to the science, and this proved to be part of the secret of success for the series. <clears throat>